Welcome back to Why This Universe. Today, we are finishing off our three-part mini-series all about string theory. If you haven't heard the previous two, we definitely recommend that you go back and listen to those first. And just a warning, today's episode will make your head hurt. We are going really in-depth into some of the most inaccessible ideas from theoretical physics. So, let's get into it. This episode of Why This Universe is supported by Wondrium. Wondrium is a mind-blowing subscription service that offers thousands of video and audio courses on a huge range of topics. I've been a big fan and a regular consumer of Wondrium's content for the past 15 years or so, and over that time I've listened to dozens of their courses, including ones on history, philosophy, literature, math, and science. For me, it's kind of like taking an intro-level university course from a great professor on a subject you've always wanted to know more about, but without the big tuition fee and all in the comfort of your own home or daily commute. I recently started listening to a series of lectures in Wondrium called Theories of Knowledge, How to Think About What You Know. The subject of epistemology is probably my favorite area of philosophy, and this course is, provides a great introduction in all the deep and messy questions that come with trying to figure out what we really know and how and why we know what we know. So if you want to learn more about epistemology or really just about anything else, give Wondrium a try. You can sign up for Wondrium now through our special URL to get a month of unlimited access for free. Just go to wondrium.com universe. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash U-N-I-V-E-R-S-E. You're listening to Why This Universe, a podcast where we break down the biggest ideas in physics. I'm Shalma Wegsman. And I'm Dan Hooper. We left off last time in the mid-1980s. The first superstring revolution had just shaken the theoretical physics landscape. String theory was poised to be the most promising candidate for a theory of quantum gravity, a theory that could completely revolutionize our understanding of the most fundamental workings of the universe, including suggesting that our universe may have extra dimensions that we can't see. But the first superstring revolution left a big mess for the physicists of the late 80s. For one, it revealed that there was not only one potential string theory, but actually five different plausible string theories. It also turned out that there are a huge number of ways to wrap up those extra dimensions of these string theories. Taking these two facts together, it was impossibly hard for physicists to point at a single most viable version of the theory. That made it also impossibly hard to make any real predictions using string theory at all. That means that no matter how compelling string theory seemed to physicists, there was no real way to know if it was right. So there was this period of about 10 years or so where string theory seemed to be stuck in this situation. There were a bunch of different theories out there, and there was no way of figuring out which of them might have anything to do with our universe. But slowly the situation started to change again in the mid-90s when what we call the second superstring revolution uh, played out. And this second superstring revolution was driven by insights that were related to an idea that physicists called duality. When you hear of duality in the context of physics, you may think of the famous particle wave duality of quantum mechanics, which says that every particle in our universe is also a wave and vice versa. This is not the kind of duality that we're talking about in this episode. Duality is a extremely weird and abstract idea, but it's also super powerful and, in my opinion, it's really profound. I'll admit right off the bat that it's not easy to explain, but I'm going to try to do my best here. Um, but, uh, you know, I'll concede that it probably won't be crystal clear even when I'm done. So imagine that you have two completely different physical theories. Each of these theories describes some sorts of things that might exist and that follow certain well-defined rules, okay? Maybe one of the theories is a theory of how some particles might behave and, and otherwise act. And then maybe the other theory is something totally different. It's a theory of space and time. So this might be like a quantum theory in the one hand, and then the other one's like a theory like general relativity, just as an example. It turns out that in some very special cases, you can look at two theories like this that seem to be completely different and unrelated to each other and show that they're mathematically completely equivalent to one another. 
when this is the case, we a physicist says that these two theories are said to be dual to one another. They look super different from the outside, but it turns out that they are totally mathematically equivalent. They can be mapped on to one another in a one-to-one fashion. This is a very abstract mathematical idea, so don't worry if you're not completely getting it yet. For a simple example, we can think of something like the electric charge of an electron. So in all of our theories of electromagnetism, the electron has a negative charge. But you can imagine that on a different planet, a species discovering electricity might have defined their theory so that the electron's charge is positive. As a result, all of their equations of electromagnetism might have this sign flip, but ultimately the two different sets of equations, theirs and ours, would describe the exact same universe. Now that's a very simple example, right? You can imagine that what we call positive and what we call negative charge isn't very significant in our description of electric fields and so on. But in more complicated examples, you could have theories describing completely different sets of physical phenomena actually being mathematically equivalent. The closest thing to an example of duality I've ever actually seen worked out in a calculation in detail was something I saw in a class when I was a grad student back at the University of Wisconsin, uh, you know, about 20 years ago. So I was taking this class and like it was mostly on fluid dynamics. And one day, The professor came in and without any explanation, he started working out a big complicated electrodynamics problem, which is not fluid dynamics. And there were electric fields and there were magnetic fields and they were doing all sorts of complicated things. And in the end, he had some sort of solution and we didn't know why. (laughs) I don't know why we didn't ask, but we had no idea what he was doing. And then the next day he came in and we're doing fluid mechanics again. And there's a bunch of, you know, uh, you know, pipes or tubes or something and a bunch of viscosity and a bunch of, you know, all this stuff. And, and he worked out the whole problem and, 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 and got an answer. And then he said, well, what if we define from yesterday, this combination of these electric and magnetic fields and, and as this new variable and this combination of stuff in this variable and whatever, and he manipulated the math and showed, oh, it's exactly the same as the solution he got in the fluid dynamics problem. So these two things didn't look like they were the same problem, but what he showed us is that that electrodynamics problem and that fluid mechanics problem seen through the right mathematical lens are really talking about something that you could think of as being the same thing. So how did this idea of duality end up launching physicists into what we now call the second superstring revolution? In the case of string theory, it was shown in the 90s that several of the different string theories that were discovered back in the 80s with the first superstring revolution were related to each other through this kind of duality. They were dual to one another. Um, So this meant that even though these theories seem to be different, they describe different kinds of things and behaved in different sorts of ways, they were all deep down talking about the same underlying theory. One of the dualities related to string theory that was discovered around this time was called T-duality. According to T-duality, certain theories that described a string moving around a circular dimension, like wrapped up in a circle of some radius, we'll call that radius R, would be dual to another theory that was describing a string moving around a circle of extra dimensions of size one over R. So what is a large dimension of space in one description of this theory is really just the same thing as a small dimension of space in another dual version of the same theory. So this is pretty weird. You have to start asking questions like, what does it mean for a piece of space to be large? If you have two perfectly good descriptions of it, one in which it's large and one in which it's small, these things start to become kind of ill-defined. And since the size of something in quantum mechanics is related to their energy, T-duality tells us that things that we might think of as being high energy objects in one version of a theory are really the same thing as a low energy object in another dual version of the same underlying theory. So T-duality tells us that the same universe could be equally described by two very different string theories. In particular, it tells us that 
those two theories can describe very different space-time geometries, and yet both ultimately describe the same exact universe. But it turns out that T-duality isn't the only kind of duality that string theorists were grappling with. Another kind of duality that was discovered around the same time is called S-duality. So according to S-duality, a theory that describes a collection of strongly interacting particles can, in certain cases, be dual to a different theory that describes instead weakly interacting particles. When we say interact strongly or weakly in this context, we aren't talking about the strong and weak nuclear forces. Instead, we're calling particles that interact a lot with their environment strongly interacting, and ones that rarely interact are weakly interacting. So S-duality says that a particle that interacts a lot with its environment in one theory maps onto a particle that hardly interacts at all in the second theory. So through T-duality, there's an ambiguity or a, a dual relationship between things that are small and big, or high energy and low energy. And through S-duality, there's a relationship, a duality between things that are strongly interacting and things that are weakly interacting. So here's where it all connects to string theory. I said before there were five different self-consistent string theories that were discovered in that first superstring revolution. Well, in the mid-90s, it was shown that some of these were related to each other through S-duality, while others were related to each other through T-duality. And when they were all done, it turns out that there weren't really five different string theories. There was one string theory which was related in these five different ways or to these five different theories through different kinds of duality. So that means deep down, all five of these string theories that were discovered are really the same theory. And this bigger theory, this you know, master theory that all of these different five theories are kind of limits of or, or special cases of became known as M theory. M theory, the all-encompassing string theory. But we're not done here. If you are a theoretical physics nerd, this next part is going to be a treat for you. A particularly powerful and famous example of duality that was identified during this era of the second superstring revolution is called the ADS-CFT correspondence. This was proposed by Juan Maldacena in 1997. And just to give you an idea of how important physicists think this idea is, I'll point out that the paper that he wrote in 97 about this has been cited about 18,000 times in journal articles. And if I'm not mistaken, I think this makes it the single most highly cited paper in the history of physics. So more than Einstein's seminal work, more than Feynman or Steve Weinberg or any of these people. This is, you know, the most cite, highly cited paper in the history of physics. Anyway, let me take a minute to unpack what this idea is all about, this ADS-CFT correspondence. You might want to take a deep breath here. You are about to hear a lot of mathy physics words. So take this moment to reflect on the space-time of our own universe. We have three spatial dimensions and one dimension of time. Our space-time is pretty flat on the whole, and there's no such thing as negative energy in our universe's space-time. In fact, if you look at a patch of so-called empty space in our universe, you'll actually find some net positive energy called vacuum energy. So physicists actually gave this version of space and time, the one we live in, a special name. They call it de Sitter space. Okay, we're now ready to look at that first part of this ADS-CFT correspondence, namely, what is ADS? ADS here stands for anti de Sitter space, which is a certain kind of space and time. The kind of space time that's found in our universe is called de Sitter space, not anti, but de Sitter space. And anti de Sitter space is a lot like that, but it has an opposite amount of vacuum energy. So whereas the energy density of empty space in our universe is positive, it's negative in anti de Sitter space. So an empty patch of anti de Sitter space actually has a net negative energy. In our universe, there is no such thing as negative energy, but in this imagined anti de Sitter space, it's all around, and it corresponds to a negative curvature of this sort of space-time. The second part of this correspondence is the CFT, which stands for conformal field theory. Conformal field theories are quantum theories of matter and energy, and they describe things like particles and stuff like that. 
So the really profound thing here is that according to this ADS-CFT correspondence, there are theories that describe anti space spacetime that are dual to a particular example of a conformal field theory. In other words, you can take certain theories of space and time and deep down show that they're exactly, completely, totally mathematically equivalent to a different theory that describes forms of matter and energy. These theories look totally different, but deep down, they're describing and talking about the same thing. One theory, ADS, is only a theory of space and time, and the other, CFT, is only a theory of matter and energy. And yet, these two theories are exactly equivalent. They are one and the same. They describe the same exact universe. Now, it's not our universe. We live in De Sitter space, not anti De Sitter space. But it does reveal that a duality of this nature is possible. A theory of space-time can describe the same universe as a theory of matter and energy. And now it's about to get a little bit weirder, maybe a lot weirder. Let's say, for example, that we're talking about a theory of anti de Sitter space-time, and that theory is four-dimensional. So there's a theory that describes three dimensions of space and one of time, and then we apply the ADS-CFT correspondence to it, and it turns out there's a quantum field theory that is dual to that theory of space and time. But it turns out that that quantum field theory won't be four-dimensional. Those particles, those, that matter and energy that's described by that quantum theory will exist in a five-dimensional form of space and time. In other words, a four-dimensional theory, according to this correspondence, will be completely equivalent to another theory that describes a universe that's five-dimensional. In this sense, it's not even well-defined to ask questions like, well, how many dimensions does that universe have? Well, it depends how you think about it. You can think about it in this way, and then it's four-dimensional, or you can think about it in this other way, and it's five-dimensional. Neither one is right or wrong, or at least more right or wrong than the other way of thinking about it. And we call this idea holography, okay? So, you know, you can picture a hologram. It has a, it's a two-dimensional object that presents a three-dimensional image. And in the same sense, uh, a, a physical theory, when you define certain things in a certain way, might look like it's, you know, exists in a certain number of dimensions of space and time. And then when you think about it in another way, through some lens of duality, it has a different number of dimensions of space and time. These examples reveal how deep and profound this idea of duality really is. Sure, it's cool that some equations can apply to one situation, and equally so to another situation, but in a deeper way, it might also mean that our universe could be describable by multiple possible theories of everything. Questions like, how many dimensions are there, or is space-time fundamental, or is matter and energy fundamental, these questions might not have well-defined answers. It might just depend on the way that you're looking at things. Yeah, maybe you could imagine some alien civilization that is just wired to think about things differently. They look at the same universe. They live in the same universe that we do. They look at that universe. They make a bunch of measurements and they build theories. And their theory, which is equally correct as ours, has a different number of dimensions of space-time. Maybe they, they think things are strongly interacting that we think of as being weakly interacting you know, uh, equivalent versions of theories. Maybe they think of high energy things that we think in terms of low energy things. It, and, and everyone's right. And we're really all talking about the same stuff, but in very different ways of thinking about it. In the last episode of this podcast, we said that in order for super string theory to be a self-consistent theory of our universe, space time had to be 10 dimensional. Well, it turns out this 10 dimensional theory is dual like through something like the ADS-CFT correspondence, to a different 11-dimensional theory. So whereas those five theories that were discovered back in the first superstring revolution were all 10-dimensional, the version that we think of in M-theory is an 11-dimensional description of space and time. Around the same time that these dualities were being worked out by string theorists, these same physicists started to think about other kinds of objects beyond simple strings that might exist in our universe. So strings are extended one-dimensional objects, okay? But modern string theory started to include 
two-dimensional sheets or brains that might extend through space-time. So this is B-R-A-N-E, not B-R-A-I-N, kind of like membrane, these sorts of things that could exist um, across the, the spanning the extra dimensions of space. And you could imagine even higher dimensional objects, three, four, five, you know, six, seven, eight, nine dimensions. Um, all these sorts of things have a place in modern string theory. So where does all this leave us? On the one hand, there really seems to be just one kind of string theory. There's this M theory is the version of string theory that I think we can all take seriously. On the other hand, there are also a huge number of ways that the extra dimensions in that theory could be wrapped up or compactified. Some physicists have tried to estimate how many different ways you could do this, and they get numbers like 10 to the 500, uh, or maybe even more. And that's a ridiculously large number. Like, even if you put all the computers on Earth uh, trying to do calculations, and, and it was all simple, like you're just trying to add numbers together 10 to the 500 times, they would never finish. We just you know, can't hope to ever do a calculation 10 to the 500 times. And this means that because of this enormous range or of possible compactifications we could consider, um, there isn't a string theory per se. There's a landscape of string theories or a string landscape. And some physicists have begun to wonder like, well, maybe there's a big multiverse and these different corners of the string landscape are populated across some of these universes that make up the multiverse. And that means in different pockets of that string landscape or the multiverse, there are going to be different universes with different kinds of apparent forms of space-time, different kinds of matter and energy, different kinds of stuff, different kinds of laws of physics. And given that we don't know where we live in that huge, vast quantum multiverse or uh, string multiverse, uh, we don't have any ability to predict what we should expect our universe to look like. Maybe one day we'll be able to use string theory to predict, at least probabilistically, what kinds of particles and other laws of physics we should expect to find in our universe. But as of now, at least, it seems like a completely insurmountable task. While I'd say that string theory is still probably our best or you know, leading theory of quantum gravity, I'd also agree that the program seems to be kind of stuck. Um, I guess we'll have to wait for a third super string revolution one day before we get some sort of resolution to this problem. And that might happen in, you know, a year. It might happen in a thousand years. It might never happen. There's just really no way to know. In the meantime, a lot of physicists have decided to invest their time and effort in other areas of research. Um, but I think it's fair to say that if somebody had a breakthrough in string theory, a lot of people would be coming back pretty quick. Why This Universe is brought to you by the University of Chicago Podcast Network. It's edited and produced by me, Shalma Wegsman, and my co-host is Dan Hooper, a professor of astrophysics at the University of Chicago and Fermilab. If you like our show and you want to support us even more, you can find us on Patreon. There you can access ad-free episodes of the show as well as exclusive Ask Us Anything episodes where you get to ask Dan and I direct questions about physics or anything else. So if you are curious about that, you can find it at patreon.com slash whythisuniverse. Thank you so much for listening and for your support.